I will start this morning with a revelation that you may not appreciate. You guys are all in agreement with Donald Trump. You guys are all in agreement with Donald Trump, which you probably didn't know. But it's not clear what we're even talking about. So a year ago, during the election, shortly after the election, fake news meant something like this. You know, Obama signs an executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance and other such stuff. And it was essentially news that was made up to look like legitimate news, as if it comes from ABC News. <laughs> and what we meant was fake sources disguised as legitimate with a high reposting volume in social media. That's how they spread their goodies. Distribution through the modern new, relatively new options of, targeted, of targeting audiences on Facebook, Google Analytics, and so on. The ad placement often generated an income stream for the guys who did it, and not everybody who was in that was in that for political goal. They would happily have posted something else. It was essentially clickbait to deliver some ads, which also brought some income stream. Also, it now increasingly turns out that there were clearly political players in that game. But, but that's what we saw just a year ago. Then Donald Trump came along and changed what, means, what's a, what now uh, means fake news for many conservatives. Fake news is now essentially the mainstream news, including some parts of Fox News that he doesn't like. It gets even better. Uh, this is Rush Limbaugh, who sees a universe of lies as it is made up by four corners of deceits. And so four corners of deceits are government, academia, media, and science. Okay? So you all got your place in the world. You're one of the four corners of deceit. <laughs> and that is endorsed uh, in public opinion data. Uh, I mean, that distrust in, in these institutions is very high and is consistently high, so more conservative you get. For yet others, fake news became more or less equivalent with the Trump administration itself, which has alternative facts. Nothing fake here, just alternative facts. And the president lies so frequently that the New York Times is maintaining a daily calendar of all the president's lies, and the days with big public lies outnumber the days without. And you can look it up by going to the website, and you can get your daily dose. OK, so this is in many ways a civic disaster. So there's obviously an increasing polarization. There's some things that we, we really need to take serious. There's no shared arbiter of truth. It is not clear who is the source who could settle issues of truth. And most likely, the long-term consequence of this is that people will tune out. So that it's just too much. It's just too irritating. It's just tiring. You have no idea what the hell is going on. And that would set the stage for low accountability once people tune out, which is essentially every autocrat's dream. Uh, so that, that's my, my prognosis for, for the future. Give us another year, and people will have tuned out. They're too exhausted. They're tuning out even more than they already have. So what do we do? So are essentially uh, well, a, a few things that are being considered. One is technical solutions, like you block sources of fake news. The others are corrections. You come out with a lot of fact checks, and you report that it was yet another lie, which uh, mainstream media do. You try to do some damage repair by setting the record straight. And you can try educational attempts, like media literacy. And what I'm showing you here is one of the things that summarizes that. It's from the International Federation of Library Associations. And it tells you all the things you're supposed to do as you are reading your stuff on Facebook. Right. Now, um, good luck. Uh, a key piece of that is check legitimacy. Uh, because you know, as the old comic goes, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And so you have to check legitimacy, and you have to find out where the source comes from. So, oh, um, my, my uh, unfortunately, I didn't want to show you that. My, my, apparently, my, my animation went away with a, is a transfer of the, of the slides. abcnews.go.com is real. 
abcnews.com.go is fake. cnn-trending.com is fake. cnn.trending.com is real. Right? So if I do this as a quiz, you wouldn't be really confident what's what. And that's exactly the point. Check your sources. Yes, please. Good luck. Um, we also recommend routinely that people check the veracity of the message. They read beyond. The things that you have most accessible to read beyond are the sources in the very things that you're reading, which are presumably the sources that support the fake news. You ask the experts, but it's not clear which experts you would ask once you believe that the media, government, science, and academia are all in cahoots as the four corners of deceit. I mean, who are you going to ask? Because there's no shared epistemic authority left. And you're supposed to check your biases, according to this poster, but most people are convinced they don't have any. So I mean, this is uh, uh, no. I mean, all very well intentioned. And with compliments to all librarians in the world, uh, this, this is not going to work. So instead, I suggest we have to ask something. Oops, my animation is gone. That's a little bit of a problem, I'm afraid. Uh, we have to ask something else, which is hidden behind the slides that doesn't come down. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do with the rest, rest of my time is to ask, how do people determine whether something is true? I mean, what makes people think that the stuff they read is actually true? And when do they check and when do they not check? Uh, no, for all these things that media literacy encouragement would tell us to do. And it turns out uh, that in many, many ways, if it does not feel wrong, people nod along. So the trigger for checking, the trigger for any critical engagement, essentially comes from your gut. And unless we understand those gut-based triggers, I think we'll, we'll make a lot of recommendations that are well-intentioned and would work if people were engaging, which most of the times they won't do. Yep, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, that, but that spared you the quiz, see? <laughs> OK, thanks. OK, so my concern is this won't work, and instead we, we ought to ask these things. right? So how do people judge truth? <coughs> which criteria do they use? Which inputs do they use? What triggers analysis? And what are they actually doing there? And uh, it, it turns out one, once you do this, that essentially uh, you need to have a, a gut sense that something is wrong to go there. That's the case because in daily conversation, acceptance is a default. And that's also the default when people read something. And we don't take that serious enough. So in daily conversation, we follow a more cooperative principle that Paul Kreis, a philosopher of language, has articulated. So that essentially it entitles us to make it very simple, to assume that the speaker is truthful, relevant, and clear. It's related to what we're currently talking about. And I cannot understand what the speaker says, not fill in the gaps and infer the meaning, unless I assume that at least temporarily. And then I can step back and, and take that thing apart. And misinformation is then picked up along the way. So for example, now if, if John asks me, where is David, is Dave around? And I look out the window and I say, oh, there's a yellow Honda out there. Uh, most people would infer later on when I ask, what car does David drive says this guy has a yellow Honda. But I never said this. I, you may just as well assume that I have ignored John's question. I didn't even notice he asked me about Dave. I was looking out the window, and I was surprised by the yellow Honda. Right? But that's not how we proceed. We proceed in a way that we assume that sequences of utterances are meaningfully related to one another, and we fill in the gaps and make meaning out of that. That's a, a kind of thing that never gets checked on. There is no explicit claim, and hence no explicit testing. You have learned that David has a yellow Honda without me ever saying it. Hence, you also didn't check whether my claim is right. You just picked up that stuff along the way. That's the basis of many push pulls. When you heard about Hillary Clinton's brain injury, 
Did you worry that it may impair her functioning? Yes, no, don't remember. It literally does not matter what you say. The person who puts that question on a push poll, this is a Republican poll from 2015. The person who puts that on a push poll doesn't care what you say. What's relevant is to place the idea that Hillary Clinton has a brain injury. That was in the context where she fainted at some, at some point, right? that she has a brain injury. You can repeat that a few times. You can later link other events to that. And you can create a narrative around that. But note that there is no explicit claim, right? Uh, it doesn't say she has one. When you heard about that she has one, did you worry? You're not asking yourself, is it really true that she had one? Is that serious enough to have a brain injury? You're checking autobiographical memory for whether you worried and, and give some answer. And you have planted an idea that you can elaborate on and that you can, that, that you can work out. So when people do not accept the stuff that comes in, which is a default, you need to override that default to get to truth testing. What do they do? Uh, we've done a number of, of, uh, of things. We've done a, a lit review. We, we talked with a lot of people. We, we did all kinds of you know, qualitative and some quantitative things uh, to look at what the criteria are. And the big five are essentially those. Is there consensus? Do other people believe it? Compatibility is what I'm reading or hearing compatible with other things I know uh, about myself and the world. Uh, coherence, is the story internally coherent and plausible? Does it come from a credible source? And is there supporting evidence? And then there's a number of other idiosyncratic things, but that's basically covering the big bulk of what people do when they're trying to find out whether something is true. So they check for consensus, compatibility with other knowledge, coherence, credibility of the source, and support. The important point for my purposes today is that you can do all of these things either analytically with declarative information, you really sit there and you think about this stuff. Or if you like that language, with slow reasoning or system two, right, or whatever you want to use as your dual process model. Or you can do that intuitively on the basis of your affective response and fluency experience, ease of processing, which is essentially your system one fast uh, reasoning. Uh, amazingly, it turns out that if, you're, if reasoning is easy, when it's, let me turn it the other way. When the information is really compatible with other things you know, when it's internally coherent, when it's shared by many others, which means you have heard it from many people, you have been you know, exposed to it many times, it becomes familiar and so on, processing becomes easier. Text that is incoherent, you stumble, it slows you down. Text that is incompatible with other things you know, you stumble and you go, oops, something's wrong. Uh, text that you've read for the first time or hear for the first time is harder to process. So essentially, easy processing provides an affirmative answer on every one of these truth criteria if you're processing at the intuitive level. And analysis is always triggered by stumbling. And if that is true, then uh, we can, and, and that's the experiments I'll talk about, uh, if that is true, then we can presumably test that by making you stumble for other reasons. And it should have similar effects. And so to you know, look ahead, what I'm going to show you today is that unless something feels wrong, mostly because you stumble, you kind of nod along and accept it in, despite better knowledge. And some of this is old and some of this is new. So let's first look at consensus. Consensus is a mainstay of social psychology. If many people believe it, there's probably something to it. It's a core assumption already of Festinger's uh, uh, theory of comparison processes. And you can do that analytically. You can ask how many believe this. You can look up poll data. You can ask your friends. Or you can do it intuitively. Does it feel familiar? 
If many people believe it, you should have heard it a few times, you should have seen it before, it shouldn't come as a surprise, and it should be familiar. But we are terribly bad at tracking this. So this is a study with Kim Weaver, in which people listen to a videotape uh, of a group discussion about some space policy in their, in their community. And so he has the same opinion uh, in one condition once, in the other condition three times, each time offered by a different person. So there are three people in the group who say so. Or three times because one and the same guy repeats it three times. And then we ask you to estimate what percentage in your community would agree with this opinion. And that is, uh, whatever that is, 56% uh, when you hear it once. It goes up to 72% when you hear it three times from three different people, which is perfectly reasonable. But you're getting two thirds of that benefit when the same guy says it three times, right? And that's within minutes after you saw the video. So a repetitive voice kind of sounds like a chorus, which is what we you know, titled that titled that paper. Uh, essentially, that means people are very sensitive to that feeling of familiarity and quite insensitive to where it comes from. And I'll say that many times this morning. Now, this is not completely stupid, uh, because familiar material is really easier to process. Hence, it's not a dumb idea to rely on ease of processing. What people miss is that it can be easy to process for many other reasons than that you, that you have heard it before. And if that is so, then any other fluency manipulation should do. So, shark cartilage is good for your arthritis, is easy to read in Arial, and harder to read in this beautiful font called Mistral. And we present that statement in one of these fonts, and we ask people to estimate what percentage of Americans or how many out of 100 Americans would agree. It's 63% in Arial, but 49% in Mistral. Right? So there's nothing in here that has to do with how often you heard it. This is simply ease of processing manipulated through the print font, which changes your perception of social consensus. The same applies for the criterion of compatibility. Uh, if it's true, it should not be at odds with other stuff you know. It should be compatible at least with other things you believe to be true. And again, you can do that analytically by checking against other knowledge, or you can do this intuitively. Is it easy to process? If it's incompatible with other things you know, you usually wonder a bit, it slows you down, it no, uh, makes you stumble. And uh, no, uh, again, we find that disfluency elicits uh, more scrutiny of content. So when we ask people, how many animals of each kind did Moses take on the ark? Most people quickly agree that it's two. Any disagreements? Uh, <laughs> so uh, most, most people disagree. Most people disagree that it's two, unless, unless they're uh, psychologists, right? And they agree that it's two, even so they know that Moses was a guy who parted the waters, and the fellow who swam on the waters was actually Noah, right? So Moses did not take any animal on any ark. Uh, he didn't know about an ark. That was, that was Noah. And you're told to say, bad question, if we ask you a question that makes no sense. So in our experiments, we say, in which year did Bill Clinton fly to the moon? And you say, bad question. And everybody understands that, right? And then we ask you about Moses, and they say, two, right? OK, so here's the experiment. We ask you, how many animals of each kind did Moses take on the ark? Or in a gray tone, a little better to read than this, but a little degraded, and a difficult print font, how many animals of each kind did Moses take on the ark? And that's work with Hun Chen Song. And uh, it's uh, more than 80% when it's in Arial, and it drops to 50% when it's in Mistral. So that's all it takes. It's a little 
gut level thing that makes it a little harder for you to read. And you suddenly notice, oh, it wasn't Moses. You know, there's, some, there's something wrong here. And again, we have a number of variations with that. You can get the same uh, effects. This was the first one. You can get the same effects uh, with accent. So I always have to say something reasonable because I'm hard to understand and you will think about it. So I better get my act together, right? But John Schultz can tell you anything. <laughs> he has a proper accent and you'll, you'll just nod along. Sorry, I disclosed your secret. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if it's easily processed, it's easily accepted, and very many, and many, many fluency variables do that. So, some of these variables are presentation variables, like print font, color, contrast, accents that have nothing to do with the substance. Some are content variable like real compatibility with your knowledge makes it easier. I mean, there is a real piece in all of this. There's always a real piece, right? Real compatibility makes it easier. Easy argument flow makes it easier. Complexity of the text makes it more difficult. And there's person variables, your own world view, which, which is the same as whether it becomes you know, compatible with your knowledge or not. The temporary accessibility of a concept. So we can make stuff more true by priming you with a concept that's in the claim in an independent, with an independent task. And then finally, the mainstay of, of every uh, uh, rhetoric and persuasion and propaganda book, which is sheer repetition. So more often you repeat it, the more familiar you feel, and the more true it becomes. And, and that's just, I mean, uh, a, a very, very robust effect. It's one of the most robust effects in cognitive psychology. You, and you throw in a lot of competitions of repetitions of the same or very similar statements, and that statement is more likely to be accepted as true, both immediately and after a longer delay. And um, uh, let me add a word on on worldview. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of work on worldview and basically things that are compatible with your worldview, or you are more likely to accept which is not a dumb idea. I mean, that really <laughs> means that it's probably coherent and so on. And, um, but again, uh, fluency plays a role in that. What's incompatible with your worldview makes it more difficult to process. And so the analytic and the intuitive response converge. It's when you think about it, it's wrong, and it feels wrong or other way around, it feels wrong immediately, and even when you take it apart, you, 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 your you know, analytic thoughts uh, uh, support it, which presumably is why worldviews are so persistent, uh, and, and I mean, so resistant to change. Um, coherence. Is it a coherent story? I mean, true messages tell a good story. They're internally coherent, compatible with common sense assumption. And the story gets better over time as you retell it. And we know a lot of that going back to the work of Nancy Pennington and Reed Hasty on the story, on the story model of jury decision making, Johnson Laird's work on, on mental models, and so on. And the easier the thing is to process, the higher is a perceived coherence. And again, that's work by Johnson Laird and Sasha Tobolinsky. And Sasha Tobolinsky has also found a manipulation that reduces perceived coherence. When people read, they essentially subvocalize. And Sasha has found that when he makes you chew gum, it impairs your subvocalization. And texts seem less coherent. And the story seems a bit less good. And it seems that you're engaging a little more in analytic reasoning. That latter part is, is hit and miss. In some studies he gets that, in some studies he, he doesn't quite get that. It's not, not quite clear why. So the chewing gum is a, is a bit of a, of a tricky thing. But he has chewing gum and chewing popcorn. Chewing popcorn in the movies protects you against believing the ads. <laughs> <laughs> it's a paper of last year. <laughs> so. Um, is it a coherent story is important in our context, and, and I, I, do not, I do not have experimental data for that. Uh, this is something that, that's on our agenda, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, when you look at all these stories about Hillary Clinton, for example, you may wonder, why is Hillary always a villain? 
I mean, you could tell, you, you could make a lot of Democrats bad guys. But Hillary has to, you know, kill people, drive them into suicide, run a sex ring, uh, goof up Benghazi. I mean, everything is Hillary, right? And logically, it doesn't make too much sense. I mean, I can tell you a few bad things about John Schultz, but when I lay it on and on, <laughs> <laughs> I should switch to Neil. Ah, poor John. That's what, that's what you get. <laughs> um, I can tell you a few bad things, but if I lay it on too heavily, right, it becomes incredible. And nevertheless, when you look at these, at these partisan claims, there is a lot where you say, this is too much, you know? I mean, what, what is this? This sounds like a caricature. But it turns out uh, that a given bad claim is much easier to process when the actor in that claim is already a, a town known villain. It's already a bad person. Making a new person a bad person is much more complicated than keeping the bad person being bad. And um, that probably explains why a lot of these Hillary claims go over really well. Also, when you don't share the perspective it seems utterly implausible and logically increasingly difficult to put together how one person can manage to you know, do all these convoluted, uh, horrible things. But the, but the intuitive uh, uh, answer is much, is much stronger here. Credibility. The true message comes from a credible source. That's not surprising. And you could do that, uh, evaluate that based on knowledge about the source. That, doesn't, that often does not have much of an effect. So for example, there's work that tested, funded by Exxon, this is an, environment, an environmental impact study, funded by Exxon versus funded by the National Science Foundation, and it makes no difference in the credibility of the message. Right? So these Exxon guys, they, they know about oil, you know? I mean, that's what they do for a living, yeah? So they're experts uh, on that. So that doesn't do much. <coughs> But the familiarity of the source has a huge effect. And again, it's, it's not a good story. So more often you see a face, literally. So more often you see a face. So more often you hear a name. The easier that name is pronounced, the more credible, likable, and expert the source seems. But we have, uh, I'll show you one version of that. We have just uh, done a study uh, where we manipulated, this is work with Rita Silva, a postdoc, uh, where we went, and, and uh, uh, the study was done in Germany, uh, where we manipulated um, the eBay handle. So this experiment is crossing easy or difficult to pronounce eBay handles. NABA 027 is easy. Adlocock gets more difficult. This thing is you know, very difficult to pronounce for people. And we have made up a number of these, of these things in various ways. We also have drawn names from different regions of the world. It's best for you to have an Anglo-Saxon name. An Eastern European name is not that good. A Middle Eastern name is horrible. Uh, but independent of that, that always looks like a main effect. Uh, within each region, we make the name easy or difficult to pronounce. And within each region, the more easy to pronounce name is more credible and more trustworthy. And in this case, we cross the, uh, the name, the pronounceability with the name uh, with explicit uh, ratings. So these people now all have high ratings, high trustworthiness ratings on eBay, reputation ratings. And in the other conditions, they only get one star. So we are looking at good reputation in the, in the reputation system of the, of the uh, seller or uh, bad reputation crossed with the names. And this is typical for uh, the whole set of studies, no matter what we throw in there. It's good for you to have a good reputation. It's not so good for you to have a bad reputation. But within each reputation, it's much better for you to have an easy to pronounce name than to have a difficult to pronounce name. And that's true when you ask people how likely is it that the product is as described when it arrives, how likely is it that the seller delivers, how likely is it that uh, they honor their return policy, how likely is it that they'll cheat you, any one of these things. 
Just having an easy to pronounce eBay handle or an easy to pronounce name makes you more credible, which is reasonably scary. Finally, evidence. So more evidence, the better, not surprisingly. And again, you can do that analytically and search for evidence, or you can do that intuitively and uh, rely on how easily some evidence comes to mind, right? That's kahneman tversky's availability heuristic. If, it easily, if there is a lot of evidence, some of it should easily come to mind. Much, much more difficult to find it when there is very little. Except the problem is that the more you search, the harder it gets. And that's an old study with Geoff Haddock, who's now at the University of Wales. And what we do here, it's a, we ask you to list three or seven arguments in favor of doctor-assisted suicide. And uh, we manipulate the diagnosticity of how easy or difficult that is. So everybody can do it, but generating three is easier than generating seven, which is harder and you have to work at it. So then we ask you how much you're in favor, how uh, confident you are. We have multiple measures of attitude strengths and that's an average. And people are more confident in their attitude when they had to list only three than when they had to list seven, which was more difficult. However, in the other condition, we play background music and we say we want to understand uh, why this music interferes with people's reasoning processes which gives you an explanation. So if you now find it difficult to think of seven, maybe it's that music that we're playing to you. And when we, only when we do that do we get what, you would, what most people would expect. Now, when the difficulty is discredited, having, many, having thought of many arguments is better than having thought of a few arguments, right? So again, it shows that people rely very strongly on their subjective experience and use that not only in evaluating uh, the source and, and the co no, coherence of the message and so on, but also the likely amount of evidence uh, that is there which influences their confidence in these statements. Along these lines, you can uh, produce feelings of ease in uh, ways that are completely uninformative. Uh, this is work by Aaron Newman, who's another postdoc. Um, and uh, she gives you statements like the liquid inside a thermometer is magnesium. And you get that statement with or without a picture of a thermometer. Now from that picture, you cannot tell what the liquid inside that thing is. But the statement becomes more likely to be accepted as true. And that's true for any picture she puts there as long as that picture is related. Turtles are deaf, or turtles have excellent hearing, with a picture of a turtle. Makes the statement more true, even so that picture tells you nothing about the hearing quality of turtles. And uh, it gets worse. This is our most recent version of that. This is uh, work with, with Lin Cheng, who's a current student, first year student. Dogs have better memories than cats. Dogs have worse memory than cats. We put a picture of a dog there, and both statements are more likely to be true. So if we tell you that dogs have better memories of cats, you're more likely to say yes when you see a picture of a dog. When we tell you they have worse memories than cats, you're more likely to say yes when you see a picture of a dog. Cats have better memories than dogs. Cats have worse memories than dogs. Again, each of these statements becomes more likely to be true when we show you a picture of a cat which basically says the picture of the subject of the claim increases acceptance of claims about the subject, even when these claims are completely contrary to one another. So then you can flip this. Does it have to be the subject? So if you put the dog... My next slide. <laughs> my, my next slide. When you flip this and you say dogs have better memories than cats, but I'm showing you a cat, now you stumble. This sentence is about a dog, and you're getting the cat, and it slows you down. Now, both of these sentences become less likely to be true. So it's less likely to be true that dogs have better memory, but it's also less likely to be true that dogs have worse memory. You just start disagreeing because something feels freaking wrong. 
<laughs> and exactly the same thing on the cats when we show you a dog. So pictures of the referent decrease acceptance of claims about the subject. And again, these things uh, in, uh, I mean, indicate how easily you can, you can read that. At least that's what we believe. Uh, we're, we're now currently doing eye tracking, and I mean, they are slower, and, and they no, back, go back if the picture is incoherent. So this stuff has <coughs> nothing to do with logic and a lot to do with your gut response. So for each truth test, easy processing helps because it results in higher perceived social, cohere social consensus, higher compatibility, higher internal coherence, higher source credibility, and higher perceived support. And that makes repetition, which is a dominant fluency variable, that makes repetition and many of these other variables very, very effective. So if things are easy to process, easy to read, easy to understand, and so on, that's great. And makes it likely that it seems true. And I should, I mean, looking at this camera, I should add a study that just got accepted last week. Um, we did snippets of an NPR, in the, of a, yeah, uh, 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 NPR Science Friday. Science Friday interview and we made the acoustics easier or more difficult to understand. We also took snippets from a video of a talk like this and made the acoustics such that it sounded like really nice or as if the microphone is a bit further away and it has a bit of an echo in the room. And then we asked people, uh, how good is the research? How good is the researcher? And should this guy be funded? And if you're doing a bad job back there on my audio, I will not get funded. <laughs> so please be good. <laughs> please be good. So that piece is, is in press in science communication as of, as of last week. And that's all it takes, right? So the, the, the Science Friday interview sounds as if the poor researcher has a bad cell phone connection. No? It's a bit noisy. So these things have. Uh, have important implications. Oh, for that reason, uh, we now know why we got <coughs> many years ago the findings that this statement is true, Osono is a city in Chile in dark blue, but this statement is not true in light blue because it's just harder to read. And all we did at the time was change the print font, but we didn't at that time know why this all comes together that way. So what does that mean? Uh, I'll address uh, implica How am I doing on time? You're doing well. You have a, uh, uh, another 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, let me address implications for the echo chambers and implications for correction. So, the social media, essentially, social media messages are always fluent. <coughs> so, stuff is curated by your friends who are credible to you and compatible which are substantive criteria for truth, analytically as well as intuitively. They are liked and reposted, which gives you explicit consensus information in the likes, and it gives you frequent exposure because they show up in your stream over and over again, which further increases uh, uh, ease of processing, perceived consensus, and so on. You, in addition, get a lot of the same stuff through the personalization of your uh, internet service, all of which guarantees that you're getting more of the same and less of anything you didn't like, which literally means the same message gets more and more familiar, fluent, and so on, and seems more and more true. And if you haven't seen that yet, but probably all of you have seen that. The Wall Street Journal, blue feed, red feed is worth looking at. They basically created a prototypical liberal and a prototypical conservative, and then see what, it, what shows up in these guys' new stream. And, and it's, it's quite impressive. They live in different worlds. The downstream consequence of that uh, is, uh, is important. Uh, it conveys to, it leaves people with the impression that we all think so. Everybody agrees. We all, at least all my friends think so. We all think so. 
which contributes to your no, usual bipartisan polarization, presumably makes contrarians shut up, which is a robust effect of being in a minority position on opinions. It also should leave you with the feeling that you are an expert because you have seen it all before. I mean, the personalization of your videos, of your, of your news feed and, and social media stream should essentially give you a sense that you are very, very, very expert. There's hardly anything that surprises you. It's all coherent with what you thought yesterday. There's nothing that, that shocks you wildly. And uh, if you have seen it all before, it should allow you to be very confident in the positions that you hold. And that should then make you wonder how others can possibly disagree. And as we know from you know, work by, by Lee Ross, uh, when others disagree, they're either stupid and you have to explain it to them, or they're malevolent and you have to get them out of your way. And stupid is, that, is what the, the so-called elites think about the so-called real Americans, and malevolent is what the so-called real Americans think about the so-called elites. And both can be quite confident that they're probably right. And that is consistent with experimental work on the spiral of silence, Elizabeth Nolan Neumann in the 60s, and, and work by Lee Ross and his students on naive realism in the 70s and 80s. Um, and that is what you would expect as a, as a no, downstream effect of the echo chamber. Sharing is about liking, and it's not about truth. Uh, I'm saying that uh, with some confidence, also the studies are ongoing, that's work with Gisem uh, Silent Hopper. And we have people read a set of media messages and rate how, how willing they are for each message to share it. And after they did that, we say, surprise, surprise, we now have a lot of other questions about these messages and have some rate these things in, in more detail. Uh, what best predicts the sharing intention is simply whether my friends would like it. Uh, most importantly, when we ask them, do you think it's true? Do you think you could well support it if pressed, you know? Uh, that comes as a surprise. And that is the only question where they click back and look back at the message. It's literally as if they hadn't quite thought about that. So, oh, um, well, I mean, let me, let me have a look, and they go back. So this was not what was on their mind when they said, yes, I'll share this, right? So um, that's, that's what we're currently doing. I mean, we're looking at things where they really have to share it, and then we ask them truth question, and we, we look how much they have to go back and, and look at that. But um, it seems quite clear that people create their image and not the news. And, and that the news curation is in that service and, and truth is a, secondary, is a secondary criterion. And you all have seen that and I, I won't uh, do much here. Uh, the intuitions of truth also have implications for corrections. Uh, corrections usually try to, um, Corrections are usually set up in a, in a way that I, I call it either the educator's perspective or the therapist's perspective. So there are these poor souls out there who believe bad stuff, and you have to educate them and cure them of their false beliefs. I think that's a terrible perspective to take. Because for every false believer, there's many, many agnostics who have no idea and have never, ever heard the false news. So by coming out, and trying to correct those false news that only John has heard, and I'm trying to educate John, I am actually exposing all of you to the fake news, right? Because a correction typically follows a model that says repeat and reject. So I say, John, it is not the case that da, da, da. What is true is ba, ba, ba. You may never have heard da, 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 but now you have, right? And, and that's essentially spreading the core of the fake news to an audience that may not have been exposed to this. Empirically, these uh, reject, repeat and reject methods work in the short run and fail in the long run. They work in the short run in the following sense. If I tell you that this is wrong and I tell you what's right and I ask you immediately afterward, 
you remember the details and you give me the right answer. Not a problem. It looks very, very successful. But then time passes, and two days later, you don't really remember the details. And as you don't remember the details, you now hear uh, Kristen say, da, 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 which now sounds much more familiar. It sounds like you heard it before, which is true, because I told you it's not true, right? <laughs> which now sounds familiar because it's repeated and you're now more likely to accept it downstream, <coughs> which is why many correction attempts backfire. Uh, there's a review of that both in, in this 2016 piece in Behavioral Science and Policy and, and some earlier work in the 2007 advances, and I'll show you just one example. This is what the CDC does to tell you that you shouldn't be worried about the flu vaccine. They call it flu vaccine facts and myth. They're, they're particularly nice for our purposes because they do everything wrong that they could do wrong, <laughs> uh, including printing the false statement in bold, right, and making it nicely prominent, and then having the facts in smaller print below that, and, and so on. So we created two versions of that. One is, is their own version, and the other that's called facts about, the tr uh, fl uh, flu, facts about flu vaccine, and we drop off all, all the wrong stuff, and so on. And uh, in what I'm showing you, we're looking at, uh, you read either, it's two conditions, you read e three conditions. You read either the facts only version, or the facts and myths version, which repeats the wrong stuff and then corrects it, uh, or you read nothing. And nothing is the control condition, which is this line. And we're asking you how important it is to get uh, the flu vaccinations this fall, and whether you intend to do so, and what I'm showing you is a mean of, of importance and, and strength of intention. And uh, if I tell you the facts and the myths, and I measure you immediately, that's fine. The thing is effective. It's, it's better than the control. If uh, I give you the facts and myths, oops, sorry, that was not what I, uh, up, I'm messing this up. Um, OK. If I give you the facts, if I give you only the facts, measure you immediately, that's effective. And if I measure you 30 minutes later, it's a very short delay in that study, that's still effective, also it drops a little bit. If I give you the facts and myths and I measure you immediately, that's just as effective. So no harm done. But if I wait 30 minutes, you're below the control condition who have never read about it. It seems that everything that's left after 30 minutes is this impression that Eh, it's kind of controversial, you know. So arguments in favor and against, and you know, I mean, who knows? And if in doubt, and if something is controversial, people stick with the status quo. So that's that that kind of a thing. And we now have a number of these things, and I don't think I have that one here. Um, one of the more scary ones: uh, we t we give people health statements, and we then put a stamp on it that says the FDA, FDA has determined that this is correct, or the FDA has determined that this is false. And we show those to you uh, once, three times, or five times. And we assess your belief in that immediately or after three days. And uh, population is college students and people between 70 and 90. And when you look at the older participants whose memory goes to hell, as we all start to experience ourselves, whose memory goes, uh, goes to hell, uh, they are after three days accepting 40% of the statements that we told them five times are false, as opposed to 11% to that we never told them are false. Right? So telling them five times it's false increases acceptance, because they don't remember what was false or, or, or wrong. But after they've seen it five times, shark cartilage is good for your arthritis. False. Shark cartilage is good for your arthritis. False. Three days later, shark cartilage, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There was something about shark cartilage. I, I guess I heard that before, right? And now it seems plausible. So repeating the false claim in order to correct it is a bad idea. Correction spread misinformation to new audiences, even when they successfully cure the afflicted. 
right? So even if you manage to really get it out of the believers' heads, you still may have spread it to many, many more people who would otherwise never have heard the thing. So we recommend that you never broadcast to all to only correct a few, and that you never repeat false information. Instead, we should try to make the true stuff as fluent as possible by making it easy to read, easy to listen to, repeating it often, and on and on. And here are the take-home points so that I repeat it often enough. Unless something feels wrong, we nod along. It literally, critical thinking comes from the gut. I'll add a word to that. Checking is limited and triggered by the gut. Uh, we lack a shared epistemic authority, which makes it very difficult to appeal to anything by saying, you know, and we know it's wrong because you know, the New York Times found so. And we spread misinformation while correcting a few. And let me add on, a, on an amusing note with a gut, which you may later on remember. Uh, in all countries, in all languages, suspicion is associated with smell. So if you say this doesn't pass a smell test or it doesn't smell right, everybody understands that. In English, the smell is specified as fishy. We've done experiments where we do something very simple. We take a fish oil capsule and we smear the fish oil under the table where you sit. And in the control conditions, there's no fish oil. And when we smear the fish oil under the table, people are better at detecting misleading information. So they notice that it wasn't Moses. That goes in that experiment from something like 70 some percent to something like 40 percent. So they notice that it wasn't Moses. It reduces confirmation bias. So they're doing better on surveillance task, and so on. So, and, and so also don't trust anybody when you play an economic trust game, they're less trusting. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is literally the gut, or in this case, the nose. And people cannot report on that. It's just diffusely something feels wrong, you know, and something's fishy here. Uh, if the fish smell is too brutal, uh, nothing works. If they walk in and they say, where's the fish? Nothing works, right? It has to be relatively subtle. But I think it's a strong illustration that critical reasoning is triggered by the feeling that something is wrong, not by, analytic, not by spontaneous analytic thought. And that's the end of my story. And, uh, and, and uh, these things are online. Almost, almost all papers are on ResearchGate. So if you just Google me on uh, Google Schwar Norbert Schwarz ResearchGate, you'll, you'll find some. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I want to switch your topic around a bit. When lies feel like truth, feel true. If you say when truth feels like lies. Yeah. Uh, is there a danger that we spent a lot of energy trying to spot fake news that we don't see true news uh, when it's right in our face? And I'll give a case in point. During the last presidential election, in spite of all the information around Donald Trump's sexual yeah. what's the word? indiscretion, millions of people still voted for him. So what's the difference between the public space and the private space. So if someone were in your private space with that level of allegations, you would probably handle it different. So how, is there any research that, that addresses this issue of how we can see obvious lies and not throw out the baby with the bathwater and assume everything is fake news? Yeah, I, I, at, at the moment, we're running some experiments comparing the Harvey Weinstein case to the Donald Trump case and looking uh, at how thinking about Weinstein or Trump influences perceptions of harassment at the workplace. And it seems to be essentially a partisan story. That people excuse the behavior of the guy on their own side as being, um, you know, uh, a little inappropriate, but not that bad, but the, which they don't do for the guy on, on the other side. And um, I think what, what has happened there is that people have believed Donald Trump, that it was locker room talk, you know, and he doesn't really do it like this, and uh, da 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 da. Uh, and and that's, that's, 
That's one piece. The other piece is that people may also not care uh, about uh, particular incidents that they think are irrelevant on the policies that may override that, that they basically feel. Um, I'd prefer him to be a nice guy, but I care that he does that stuff, and if he's otherwise a bastard, so be it. Uh, you know, and uh, that surely was uh, also the uh, response to uh, to the Clinton impeachment, right? Which had a similar which had a similar flavor, where you say, well, you know, I mean, I wouldn't my I wouldn't want my spouse to do it, but you know, that's not my problem, and the economy is doing well, and on policies I agree with him, and that. <laughs> Other comments, David? Uh, yeah, I um, uh, want you to uh, uh, comment on this, which is that in yesterday's discussion, we talked about um, putting the onus on individuals uh, for corralling or correcting uh, misinformation. We also talked about regulation top down and so forth. Uh, but there are two other sources of correction that if the individual fails, you might want to go to. And I want to get uh, your thoughts on this. One is the clouds, that is you sum up people, and maybe you get a better picture of what's true versus what's false. The second is uh, formulae. I mean, in the 1950s version of that was uh, Paul Meal, in terms of could you identify variables that could indicate whether or not a story was true or false. And in the, the 2017 version of that, is machine learning. Yeah. That is, can we build machines that can do this job for us? Because we do seem to be using cues uh, either too much or inappropriately that really don't guide us that well. And so there's sort of, in, instead of going all the way from individual to, let's say, top yeah. down uh, regulation, there's this middle ground. I wanted to get, get your sense for thinking about those two middle grounds. No, I, I, I think that is, uh, I, I think that is a. Uh, um, that is probably the most promising way, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's some simple things which we already mentioned yesterday. Like on Facebook, I can only see how many people like it. Right. I cannot see how many thousands would dislike it. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see a thumbs down mm -hmm. or a question mark uh, mm -hmm. things that I can click, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, which, 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 is not, which is not there. Uh, on the machine learning side, I, I think you're right. I mean, it could be possible, and I assume that's what uh, Facebook and so on yeah, is, yeah. Is, <laughs> is trying to do, right? right? right. In, identifying, in identifying fake, fake news and right. flagging it. Right. I'm not sure how well that will work. Uh, so I'm, I mean, assume that the machine learning is, is fine and you flag the right things. Mm -hmm. But if you have bought into Rush Limbo's four corners of deceit, mm -hmm. which are government, media, academia, and science, mm -hmm. then, I mean, honestly, uh, why should I care mm -hmm. that uh, a representative of the media mm -hmm. flags this as fake news mm -hmm. or that some scientist says it's incompatible with evidence? Right. <laughs> right? I mean, none of these guys has any standing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, in, in my eyes, I mean, that's the most dangerous piece of, of the current debate. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. now, uh, even if we figure out what would be an accessible and compelling format to correct for something, if the person who offers it never has any standing unless he is a member of your club, <laughs> then we can go home. Uh, that's, and, and I don't know how to deal with that. I, 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 don't, I don't know how we can get beyond that. And surely the, the way the, the current discussion works, it, it's, it's so clear that the mainstream media <coughs> are not Trumpists. Right? Right. That if you were a Trumpist, you would not give these guys any credibility and vice versa. Okay, thank you.